Creme 2 News begins now. Thank you for joining us on Creme 2 Plus. I'm Tim Pham. This is your Creme 2 News Week in Review. Join us as we take a closer look at some of the biggest stories in the Inland Northwest this past week. Zella Blair tells me her son Jack and daughter Delilah had just one week of school left here at Chatteroy Elementary School. Jack's name is even displayed as one of the graduating fourth graders. But after a deadly car accident over the weekend, Blair is being forced to come to terms with the fact that she won't see her son go to middle school or spend the summer with her daughter. Zella Blair is still processing her reality of life after a weekend of tears and tragedy. I don't know if I can ever get used to them not, you know, coming through the door after school and yelling for me again. You know, they were huge. They were my whole life. Her 10-year-old son, Jack, and 8-year-old daughter, Delilah, were killed in a car accident Saturday. They were with her former partner, Calvin, and older sister, Dakota, at the time of the crash. Their car was found overturned in the Salmon River. I just dropped to my knees and I screamed and I just started crying. I just couldn't believe it. Blair says they were taken from her just as they were beginning to blossom. She says Jack was making his first really good friend and Delilah was learning to write poetry. I'm just going to miss so much just being able to just go give them a hug and go give them a kiss and talk to them about their day and just all the little conversations because it just, it just made my heart full. Fiance Taylor Schaefer Bishop says he's been supporting Blair as much as he can. I've had to really be the foundation for her. While also coping with losing his children. Before I met them, I wasn't a father. Like I had no experience of being a dad and like they honestly inspired me to be the man that I am today and like step up into those shoes and like become a father figure. Blair says she will always tell people how wonderful her kids were. She says they were incredible older siblings to their younger brother Barrett and gave the world so much love. I've also been in touch with Amber, who was in a relationship with Calvin and lived with Dakota and Jack and Delilah on the weekends. Her stepfather told me in part on her behalf, words cannot express how devastating this loss is to our family. Calvin was a truly exceptional human being, and we're lucky to have had the time with him that we did. Dakota, Calvin's oldest, just turned 17 and was still deciding how she wanted to tackle the world after high school. She had amazing friends that brought her so much joy. For that statement in full, visit our website, creme.com. In Chatteroy, Janelle Finch, Creme 2 News. It's one of those things that once you notice it, you can't unnotice it. Riggins, it's kind of a fishing town. Salmon fishing. And it's Michael Reinhardt's destination of choice. Oh yeah, it's good fishing, real good fishing. But not an easy one to get to. It can be quite taxing, especially on your eyes and fall asleep. You'll go right off the canyon. By way of Highway 95, you'll notice the details on the way here, too. At least... I uh, Being the passenger, I'm nervous constantly. Shelly and Rick do. Sir here. And that's not to say there aren't guardrails on 95. I'm looking at one right now, just a mile or so north of Riggins. But if you take 95 north just a little bit further, that guardrail now is completely gone within a mile of where we were before. And the road's still windy, and the river's right there. I always dread driving along the river because of the guardrail situation or the lack of. It just seems really random where they're placed. It's not the big sign welcoming you to town. They call it rigging because there's so many rocks, you're gonna have to keep rigging up your reel. But you'll notice it all the same. You know, they only got so much money to take care of the freeways around here, so. Reporting from Riggins, Andrew Bartline, Rem 2 News. Today, the Idaho County Sheriff's Office releasing an accident report providing new details in the tragic crash which killed a Spokane family of four. On June 10th, a fisherman discovered a car upside down partially submerged in the Salmon River just north of Riggins. 36-year-old Calvin Miller and his children, Jack, 10, Delilah, 8, were all killed in the crash along with his daughter, 17-year-old Dakota Miller, who was behind the wheel. Authorities believe Dakota became fatigued driving from Spokane en route to Council, Idaho, and fell asleep at the wheel, driving off the highway and striking a large pile of rocks, which sent the vehicle airborne and into the river, landing upside down just north of the town of Riggins. I don't know if I can ever get used to them not, you know, coming through the door after school and yelling for me again. You know, 
they were huge. They were my whole life. Zella Blair's son Jack and daughter Delilah were in the back seat traveling with her former partner Calvin and older half sister Dakota. I just dropped to my knees and I screamed and I just started crying. I just couldn't believe it. The driver's window was broken and the report says extremely cold water filled the cab of the vehicle, resulting in the drowning deaths of all four inside. Idaho State Police continue to investigate the crash. A lot was talked about at that announcement, including more about how to combat crime in the downtown area, as well as continuing the homelessness outreach. For more than a decade, Robert Hetner's made the downtown corner of Spokane Falls Boulevard and Howard his home for slinging hot dogs and meeting new faces. I meet people from around the entire world here in Spokane, everywhere from Russia through Australia. I've met people from South America, every country you can imagine. But he also knows downtown has some issues. Is there homelessness? Are there, are there kids? Yes. I wish there was none. But that's a lot to ask for. <laughs> but with the summer months here, the city of Spokane's hoping to do something about those issues. Spokane Mayor Nadine Woodward announced Thursday morning the new Safe Spokane Summer Initiative. This initiative gets our house ready for guests this summer. According to Mayor Woodward, the plan has several parts, including regularly cleaning up under viaducts and the downtown gateways off of Interstate 90 and sending out the homeless outreach team more often. The mayor also says they're relaunching the city's Give Real Change initiative, which asks people to donate the change they would have given to panhandlers to service organizations and nonprofits instead. Spokane Police Chief Craig Meidel also spoke about the changes made in the department to address safety, including changing up staffing to double the number of officers assigned downtown. Chief Meidel says last year they had about 12 officers assigned. Now it's around 24. Additionally, with the warmer weather, uh, you're going to see our officers on bikes and on foot patrol virtually every single day making contacts with the community, with visitors, with business owners as well. While the Safe Spokane summer plan's just getting started, Hetner hopes it'll have an impact since he says keeping downtown safe is incredibly important. This is the revenue center. This park and these hotels generate tourism and millions and millions of dollars. As soon as a tourist doesn't feel safe, we lose a lot of business. Now, there was a lot talked about during this announcement. For a full list of the details, visit us online at creme.com. In Spokane, Cody Proctor, Crem 2 News. It's a familiar sight, this gap along Green Street. But now Spokane's one step closer to bridging north and south by bridging the Spokane River. Three, two, one. The next phase of Spokane's North-South Freeway broke ground Tuesday. The Spokane River crossing will connect the project north of the river to the section near Spokane Community College. A small chunk. We can do big things when we come together. That'll be a big part of the freeway from US 395 to the interstate. They're talking about a 12 minute run from I-90 all the way out to Wandermere. Try doing that in about 45 minutes now. This is going to be a blessing. The $68 million section represents a piece that almost didn't happen after Governor Jay Inslee suggested pulling freeway funding for four years. I've not seen the community rally around something so strongly, so quickly, and so vocally. A bipartisan effort in both chambers of the state legislature kept that money flowing, meaning when the corridor is done, traffic will also flow more freely and quickly from north to south. It's the environmentally friendly part of this because we're going to be getting people off of Division, Market, Hamilton, um, and stopping that stop and go traffic. Reimagining Division Street as a city street and not a state highway. The river crossing is expected to be done by 2025. And now take a look. Take a look how close this corridor is to I-90. It is just about done. Right now, the entire north-south freeway is expected to be complete in 2030. Shannon Mowdy, Prem 2 News. Up until this evening, that authority to investigate the chief was reserved for the mayor and human resources department. Over the last few months, Mayor Nadine Woodward has declined to initiate a formal investigation into Chief Craig Meidel over complaints surrounding his communications with the Spokane business community and allegations Meidel provided them special access. 
Councilwoman Betsy Wilkerson called the situation a quote hot mess and says the mayor should have launched an investigation. She voted to approve the ordinance along with five other council members tonight, including Councilman Michael Cathcart, even though he warned this new authority could actually jeopardize the ombudsman's main purpose. He says it's essential for the chief and ombudsman to have a working relationship. We've heard a lot of people tonight talk about wanting uh, the police, broadly speaking, investigated. 100%. That's absolutely why we have an independent ombudsman system. The problem is, again, that ombudsman has to have a working relationship with the chief in the code, several times stated, for that to work expeditiously, appropriately, accurately, for there really to be a good outcome at all if you want folks being held accountable. Cathcart believes the city needs an inspector general to investigate the chief and other department heads if and when complaints are made. Council members are supportive of that but didn't want to wait any longer to pass this ordinance. And tonight, council members were not ready to vote on another ordinance that would increase the penalty for being in city parks after hours to a misdemeanor. Right now, it's a non-traffic civil infraction. They'll revisit the issue June 26th. In the studio, Kyle Simchuk, Krem2 News. That's the thing. How many people have got a second chance here in this room? Thursday mornings at Reclaim Project Recovery are for sharing before the work stacks up and the work's just beginning yes. as they prepare to move. We are, we're pretty big here in Spokane right now. We, we do a lot. Spokane Valley City Council awarded $4 million in American Rescue Plan funds to five nonprofits to launch or expand programs that address homelessness. Reclaim will get $1.4 million. With the city awarding us that money, we're able to bring a seed or a piece of all of our program that we're already operating here in Spokane to the Valley. The group guides men out of addiction, incarceration and homelessness into housing and jobs. And just blocks from Spokane Valley's border along East Mission, another nonprofit's expansion will serve a different population facing homelessness. When we first started looking at moving Crosswalk to a different location, we made sure to talk to the youth in our program, and they really expressed the want to have, be out of downtown and to be embedded in a neighborhood. Spokane's Volunteers of America will break ground this fall on a new, larger Crosswalk shelter. $500,000 from Spokane Valley closed the final funding gap on the $16 million project. We'll keep the bed capacity the same in the shelter at 18 beds and then we're going to add dorm style apartments above for 16 to 20 year olds. About 19 percent of VOA's youngest clients are in the valley. The 45,000 square foot facility will house 13 to 17 year olds at all hours. Teens up to 21 will use the center during the day. For Reclaim, a second facility in the valley will offer more space than their building on Broadway. It'll serve as an operations hub and house their construction company and a thrift store. And we'll be employing people that are pretty hard to employ. Um, we'll also bring like a re uh, recovery um, support out there. The group's still looking for a site and some nuisance houses to renovate for use as transitional sober living. Not only help men reclaim their lives, but we reclaim neighborhoods. When we come in and we clean up these places and clean up these houses, we become like a lighthouse in those, those areas. We're just gonna take a practical approach of getting people housed, getting people employed. Shannon Mowdy. Giving some, some pride back to people. Creme 2 News. Parking in some Spokane neighborhoods can be tough, so you might be tempted to grab the first spot you see regardless of which direction you are heading, but there are rules when it comes to parking. Our verified question comes from Russell, who writes, I notice a lot of people parking backwards on streets here in Spokane. Is this even legal? Let's verify. Our sources are Washington State Code on the Rules of the Road, the City of Spokane, and the Spokane Police Department. Washington State Code states, every vehicle stopped or parked upon a two-way roadway shall be stopped or parked with the right-hand wheels parallel to the right-hand curb or edge of the roadway. This means cars must be parked with the flow of traffic. We checked with the city of Spokane to verify there were no local exceptions, and it turns out Spokane Municipal Code is even more clear, stating, no person shall stop, stand, or park a vehicle upon a public right-of-way other than with the direction of authorized traffic movement. So we can verify, no, it's not legal to park against the flow of traffic in Spokane. 
However, when it comes to enforcement, Spokane Police Sergeant Teresa Fuller tells Verify officers are not actively looking for or ticketing vehicles for parking on the wrong side of the street. She said city parking enforcement would be more likely to ticket for this, and drivers caught parking the wrong way could face a $45 fine. If you have any questions you'd like verified, let me know. Just email verify at creme.com. It's called the Safe Home, Safe Community Initiative. Federal prosecutors are working with local prosecutors to identify repeat offenders who have also been charged with unlawful possession of a firearm. By bringing these cases to federal court, criminals are often sentenced to more time behind bars. 43-year-old Frederick Terrell is a felon with several domestic violence assault convictions. He's lost his right to have a gun, but in April 2022, he recorded a video of himself at a shooting range firing a weapon and sent it to a woman he had harmed and threatened in the past. We were in federal court Tuesday when a judge sentenced Terrell to 51 months in prison, just over four years. The case is the first sentencing to result from the Eastern District of Washington's Safe Homes, Safe Community Initiative in Spokane. We want to send a strong message to individuals who are unlawfully possessing firearms and threatening family members, loved ones, and the community overall, especially law enforcement who often respond to these incidences, that we will take a stand against domestic violence and unlawful possession of firearms. U.S. Attorney Vanessa Waldriff says her office is working with local prosecutors and domestic violence advocates to identify the most dangerous offenders in the community facing state charges and bringing those cases to federal court. We look at what are the largest impactful cases that we can bring because federal charges often carry longer prison sentences, more robust federal supervised uh, release conditions. And just this afternoon, another violent offender learned he will spend the next 14 years in federal prison. 29-year-old Felipe Tapia Perez fired a gun during a domestic violence incident. The bullet struck his four-year-old son in the head, killing him. Perez was in the country illegally and therefore not allowed to possess a firearm. During the incident, he also violated a domestic violence protective order. While Perez and Terrell are among the first to be sentenced as a result of the initiative, they won't be the last. We're taking cases that can send a message that we will not stand for domestic violence abusers illegally possessing firearms in our community. Waldriff says a victim of domestic violence is five times more likely to be murdered when their abuser has access to a gun. The National Domestic Violence Hotline is 800-799-7233. Some people are asking questions about a survey about Spokane's mayoral race. I spent the day tracking down the creator of that survey and asking if the survey can be sent out anonymously. Our questions are, who created the survey? And is it required for the creator to identify themselves? To verify, our sources are the People for Nadine Woodward campaign, Lisa Brown for Mayor campaign, the Spokane County Elections Office, and the Public Disclosure Commission. One of the anonymous text messages came through like this, telling the user, have your voice heard. Answer our short survey about the Spokane local elections. The link opens to a questionnaire about the city of Spokane's upcoming mayoral race. One of the questions asked, if the primary election happened today, who would you be most likely to vote for? A section of the survey also shared specific information on the candidates, asking if certain statements made the user more or less likely to support them. Statements on mayoral candidate Lisa Brown spoke to unfavorable aspects of her campaign. Statements on incumbent Mayor Nadine Woodward were overall more favorable. Here's what we can confirm right now. The Spokane County Elections Office, the People for Nadine Woodward campaign, and the Lisa Brown for Mayor campaign all claim the survey did not come from their offices. And at this point, we cannot verify who made the survey. That's because right now, the Public Disclosure Commission website shows no reports of individual expenditures, meaning no outside contributors have reported to spending funds specifically for or against Brown or Woodward. To answer the question, is it required for the creator to identify themselves? That needs context. The Public Disclosure Commission website says most political advertising must include a message that explains who paid for it using a sponsorship ID. 
campaigns and most other advertising sponsors must report to the PDC how much money was spent on that advertising, who the ad benefits, and in some cases, when the ad was shared with the public. The PDC told me over the phone a survey like this should have a sponsorship ID, but it does not. So we can verify the campaigns for Woodward and Brown did not create this survey, but we may soon find out if a group outside of those campaigns did. That is, once the PDC filings are updated next week. Meantime, the Washington Secretary of State advises all voters to scrutinize links from unknown sources. In the studio, Janelle Finch, Crime 2 News. I'm outside Ferris's football practice where this year you'll see players cheering each other on and even dancing with one another and that's all thanks to their new head coach, Jarrell Haynes. You'll see a new man at the helm if you look to the sidelines this fall during Ferris football games. Good job, Wagon Blast! After two years as Ferris's defensive coordinator, Jarrell Haynes is a new head coach for the Saxons. I think uh, we're going to have an opportunity to surprise some people. But that's not his only new job. Just last week, Haynes was appointed as director for the city's civil rights office. Now he's changing the way the city tackles diversity while teaching tackling on the field. And there's a lot of overlap, right? My work at the city and my work as a head football coach is, is based largely around relationships building relationships and bringing people together to work toward tom common goals. Three years ago, he was the school board president for Spokane Public Schools. And before this year, he was a city civil rights coordinator and Ferris football's defensive coach. Uh, racial issues and tensions uh, are always something that's near and dear to my heart. He says he looks forward to combining his skills in his new jobs. Well, I hope that my day-to-day -day job helps me build a more equitable and inclusive football team and, and, and football culture up, up there at Ferris High School. Players on Ferris's team have already seen a shift in culture. I guess it is a little more loose this year. We have music on the field. Uh, it's still focused as last year. Uh, it's just more of a structure and a game plan and organized practices. John Olson is a starting quarterback for the team. He can't wait to see what Haynes brings to the table. I think we're working the hardest out of anybody in the GSL, so I'm excited. I think. It's going to be a great season. We show up at the school. and Haynes says he's blessed to have both opportunities, but he knows it doesn't come without a challenge. we got a long way to go, but they've gotten better every single day. You know, their energy is improving day after day. The Saxons play their first game against rival Lewis and Clark on September 1st. Haynes tells me that he's only the second ever black head coach to coach at Ferris High School, which also makes him only the third ever black head coach in the Greater Spokane League. In Spokane, Nathan Hyun, Krem 2 News. Believe it or not, a mother is the founder of Father's Day, and it happened in Spokane. In 1909, Sonora Dodd is in church with her husband in downtown Spokane on Mother's Day. And she started to drift to her own childhood in her mind and think, well, how wonderful fathers are. How come there isn't a Father's Day? So she petitioned the Spokane Ministerial Alliance and the YMCA and other groups in town and persuaded them to believe, as she did, that fathers deserved a special day. One was created and celebrated for the very first time in Spokane, Washington in the year of 1910, third Sunday of the month of June. The reason why Sonora was particularly proud of her dad is that her dad was a single dad of six kids. Uh, Mom passed away very early in her childhood. Uh, there is a plaque in front of the house where Mrs. Dodd lived all of her adult life uh, at the bottom of the Perry Street Hill, the only private home anywhere in eastern Washington declared a national historic site. In those days, she was identified as Mrs. John Bruce Dodd. Her name didn't really enter into any public conversation. She was born into a world where women did not have suffrage, where they didn't have the right to vote, they didn't have personhood. It's interesting that she had the idea uh, in 1909, saw it happen for the first time in 1910, and then labors for the next 62 years to make it happen as a national event. It was celebrated here and there and at other places across the country and various presidents declared things for a day, but nothing permanent. And Richard Nixon, then as president in 1972, just before we got the Expo World's Fair here in Spokane, we're standing by her headstone upon which is engraved the year 1978. So she lived a few years when Father's Day was a national holiday. We can all take this holiday to heart, and we can be grateful that a woman by the name of Sonora Dodd in Spokane thought enough of her dad 
to create a national holiday that give us all a reason to say thanks, Dad. It's your favorite apple girl. I don't know if you remember, but I'm the chick who talks about apples all the time. These bees are responsible for pollinating all of these apple blossoms. Every apple's got its own story to tell, so don't judge a book by its cover. Hey, I'm Kate Thornton. I'm a fourth generation apple and pear grower from up in north central Washington. Tenasket to be specific. This is pretty crazy for me. I'm in Spokane, Washington at Perone Produce, and they've got my face on eight reefer trailers. I've grown up around farming. I've seen the heartache seen the blood, sweat, and tears, but I've also seen a lot of the positive sides of farming. So my parents started out with about 23 acres and built it into now 440 acres. We've got about 60% pears, 40% apples. I really took a lot of interest when I was about 15, 16 years old. I think, you know, growing up in a small town, you're kind of in a bubble, and I just wanted to share that with the world. Okay, first day of harvest. People would recognize me at like our local rodeo or at a concert or something. And then when I went to college, I had about 80,000 followers on TikTok. I kept posting. I would go home every weekend almost. I'd have about a day and a half. This is the easy part. And I'd go through all that footage and I would put together videos and um, put them out there and they did well. Here we are today. I got almost 350,000 on TikTok. An apple like this. It's got a good amount of color on it. I'm a high energy person, so I'm always doing something, right? So I like to show people what's going on in the orchard at the time, right? I like to show them where their food comes from, what we're doing at that given time, because there's so many things that happen with each season and each step of the way to harvest. Um, a lot of talking about equipment. I love, I love driving big trucks. I love running equipment. That's a huge part of how we operate on our farm. And then I do a lot of more like trendy, relatable things to a farmer or to someone who lives in the country or a small town. And I just kind of share that with people and they seem to like it. I came within eight feet of him. There's hundreds of reports. I have seen things I cannot explain in the woods. I was close enough to him to see his eye color. It's fun to go out and look for Sasquatch. My name is Angelique Benham. I am with Legacy Discoveries and working with the Medellin Falls Bigfoot Festival. There are forest people and they're a part of our culture and have been for thousands of years. I'm Tara Leiniger. I'm mayor of Medellin Falls. The Lions had an excursion train up here for years and years and years. That brought close to 3,000 people in a weekend. And, and when you lose something like that, finding something to replace it is nearly impossible. This has, has been a close second as far as bringing people in. My name is Marshall White. I'm the owner and operator of Quest 61 Media here in Medellin Falls. Some of the small businesses like this will make enough money on the weekend of the Bigfoot Festival that it pretty much equals everything else they make the rest of the summer. I'm Mary Kate. I'm a household goddess. <laughs> My husband and I own the New View Show House. I think the first year was 21. That was the difference between making it through the summer and being able to continue through the winter. We sold so much popcorn that first year because we have award-winning popcorn. We won national awards for our theater popcorn. It's so exciting to see all these people get together and share a love of something. Jennifer Wujic, I'm the manager of the Falls Market. We will see up to a thousand customers that day. On any given day, we see about 200. This is Raven's Total Sassy, and this is one that a seasoning and I made up specifically for the Bigfoot Festival. My name is Bobby Stang, and I have been a vendor up at the Bigfoot Festival for three years. It brings people into one of the be most beautiful areas for Ponderay County, and they get to see what we get to enjoy every day. Come with an open mind. You may not have seen one of them, but I promise you, they've seen you. Thank you for joining us here on Creme 2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories of the past week. For the most current news throughout the weekend, you can watch our latest newscast right here on Creme 2 Plus. Just look for them in the bottom navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.